which is a sort of a, a Mount Everest question that you just want to solve because it's it's a, is a major breakthrough on a subject that has bedeviled mathematicians since ancient times. This new result by uh, Yitan Zhan, which says that there are actually infinite many pairs of primes, which are separated by no more than about 70 million. You started spreading through Twitter that some mathematician had proved that prime gaps were bounded. So when I saw that, I was immediately interested, and I started calling up some mathematicians and saying, is this real? You know, who is this person? Never heard of him. Absolutely never heard of him. And when I heard a rumor about that it was possible this was done, and roughly what techniques were used, I said, there's no way somebody I've never heard of has done this. I mean, really unusual to have someone like, um, you know, sort of outside the math world or just on the fringe of it, just come up with this kind of result. And it basically seems pretty normal. I really believe the mathematics should be very pure. I love math. No one taught me, but myself, I like to read, to learn, and to think. Although we say that mathematics, it should be logical, of course, it is logical. But at the very beginning, you are thinking, you are feeling. It seems very unclear, then you try to make it clear and clear again. That could be, say, intuition. This intuition is sometimes harder to describe by words. is a number that's not divisible by any smaller numbers except for one. So for example, two is prime and three is prime, but four isn't prime because four is divisible by two. Prime numbers are considered the atoms of arithmetic because any number can be written as a product of primes in exactly one way. For example, 12 is two times two times three. So that's sort of the chemical formula of that number. Prime numbers are one of the oldest topics in mathematics. The ancient Greeks um, studied them. Euclid, for example, proved that there's infinite, infinite many prime, prime numbers it's called Euclid's theorem. Um, but despite being one of the oldest um, of optical studies, we, we still don't understand them nearly as well as, as we would like. And it's this combination of them being utterly fundamental and um, so integral to the whole of mathematics, yet at the same time being so somehow incomprehensible that we're unable to say even some of the most basic questions one might ask about these objects that is just utterly fascinating from my point of view. How often are there primes? So, for instance, if you start looking amongst the, the whole numbers, you get the numbers 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13 as prime numbers, and you say, well, are there any patterns? Well, after the first one, 2, a lot, right? 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, don't you know there are infinitely many? Do the first patterns you see persist? The proportion of primes up to a given point gets smaller and smaller as the number gets larger. So you might think, based on that, that primes keep getting further and further away from each other as we as we go out to infinity. But there's a conjecture which is called the twin prime conjecture, which is quite old, where people realize that no matter how far they look, they could always find a pair of primes like 17 and 19 or 29 and 31, which differ only by two. So this is the smallest possible gap that you could have between prime numbers, and it's believed that this gap appears infinitely often. With prime numbers, you would never expect to see a pattern of two numbers right next to each other appearing again and again, because one of those two numbers would have to be even, and the only even prime number is two. But you might expect to see pairs of primes that differ by a spacing of two, like three and five, five and seven. You might expect to see that appearing again and again and again, but no one knows whether that's true, and that's the twin primes conjecture. It could be, theoretically, that the primes have some weird conspiracy between them, that they have some gentleman's agreement, that every time 
one number decides to be prime, then the number two spaces down will always agree not to be prime. Twin prime conjecture is the statement that this doesn't happen, this conspiracy doesn't happen. But we don't have ways of ruling out these conspiracies because we, we don't understand the primes well enough to, to show that they don't have any unexpected patterns like this. There is this very definite sequence of what the primes are, but if we zoom out and look at the large scale order of what the primes are, then they seem to behave like just random numbers thrown down with a certain probability. So you throw down this number and say it's prime with a certain chance, they do the same thing with the next one and so on. And so the twin primes is kind of a test case of that random model. More recently, um, prime numbers and number theory have become very important in cryptography. A lot of our best cryptographic algorithms for encrypting data on the internet or making sure your ATM card is securely read and so forth. They use algorithms that involve prime numbers because we believe that various mathematical operations using prime numbers are very good at mixing up data and turning sort of clear text data into something which is very hard to decipher. Internet commerce is based on an understanding prime numbers and the understanding prime numbers doesn't come because people say, oh, there'll be internet commerce with those prime numbers, so figure it out. It comes because people spent their time having fun with it. They came up with ideas and then later people said, oh, no, we could do something really tricky with this and hide secrets on the internet. If the twin prime ever ran out, it'd be a huge shock. Uh, as I said, we'd have to rethink all of our cryptographic assumptions. We'd have to rethink a lot of, a lot of number theory. It would be very shocking. I was born in Shanghai in 1955. My father was the college teacher and also an engineer. And my mother is just a secretary in government agency. My parents had moved to Beijing. And they lived me in Shanghai. One reason maybe is my grandmother could take care of me. My grandmother, grandfather, my father, mother, and me, and my aunts, and uncles, and cousins. When I was 10, I learned something very important in number theory, such as the famous last theorem, such as the good, good back conjecture. But as I remember, there was no twin price problem. He was interested in mathematics because when he was a little child, he bought a book called 100,000 Wives. Then I moved to Beijing in when I was 13. Cultural Revolution, I think his father was being punished. Everybody has that kind of like experience in China, especially in my age. My father started a little more from that. Before 1949, the year the communists took over China, he was a secret communist party member. But then they said, maybe you were a spy. During the Cultural Revolution, there was a lot of informers. The situation taught us not to reveal what we were really thinking, even to your parents or parents to your children. I went to the countryside of the farm with my mother. That was because of the Cultural Revolution. We had to have the meet just together in the dining room. It is not good. It was a terrible time. We did a heavy physical labors. But as a child, I didn't feel too bad. Still right now, if I have a chance, I will go back to the countryside. All of a sudden, the university is closed and there's a high school and there's school, no schools. So really, the communists try to re-educate us to learn the value of farmers, workers, and also soldiers. Because of my, my father's the political problem still is there had not been any conclusion. I couldn't enter the high school. 
I worked as a worker for a couple of years. Then in 1978, after the Communist Revolution, I got a chance to go to the college, Peking University. In the exam to the university, I didn't do well in on the political exam, <laughs> but I passed. In Peking University, I met um, many good professors. I met his advisor from masters when he was a masters at Peking University, Pan, Professor Pan, and he uh, made clear that Zhang was uh, singularly strong and the best student finishing in Beijing. So it's clear that he set his sights very high from then on, and has always gone for the big thing. Professor Pan was a very responsible teacher, professor. Because that was only the master degree, so the, he said he wished I could do it very quickly to get a degree quickly, so I just did it. It just took about a couple of months. But unfortunately, in China, the personal relationships should be very careful. Unfortunately, I didn't realize that. I had a chance to go to San Diego, UC San Diego, with a good book with Professor Spark. But uh, Professor Ding preferred me to learn algebraic geometry rather than number theory. Anyway, I changed it. But um, still my interest uh, had been in number theory. They didn't take so much uh, about the respect to the, your personal freedom, your personal choice. That's the Chinese way in that time for something for the interest of the country, the interest of the society. I spent uh, around one year in Peking University. After Ding had blocked the arrangement for Tom to go and work with Harold Stark, the next year, T.T. Mo came to Beijing to recruit students, and he was an algebraic gentleman, so Ding was happy to have Zhang go with him. Zhang went to Purdue with him and began to work with the problem that Mo assigned him, a famous problem called the Jacobian problem. His thesis was on the Jacobi conjecture, which has just, you know, crushed all sorts of mathematicians who've made fools out of themselves on that one. And I believe that in my solution on the Jacobi conjecture should be very close to the final. Zhang did some nice work on this problem and actually thought he'd solved it, but the solution was based on a lemma that Mo had proven, except that Mo hadn't proven it. It turned out to be false. And so the proof collapsed. He tried uh, to, uh, to solve another problem, like uh, the resolution of singularities. Yeah. They worked together in that for about six years, and then it became clear that Mo's approach, which he wanted to follow, was not going to work, and Mo gave up. Then never wrote Jean a letter of recommendation. That's pretty fatal for a student. His attitude to me was not was not good. He just complained that no Chinese student is good. Then I couldn't find a job. He's not only a mathematician, he's a good person. I knew him through an organization called Chinese Alliance for democracy. Both of us are members. I believe still this organization is illegal in mainland China. The organization actually started with the Chinese uh, overseas students. First, it was a magazine to promote the democratic movement in China. Our slogan is freedom, democracy, rule of law, and pluralism. They have a very uh, special friendship between the two of them. They both were brave enough to stand up for their ideal and for their um, belief. So that's a very special foundation for them to build a friendship. You have to have this deep trust. In this moment, then, the, the good, one of the good results is that I have a connection with some good friends. They found the common interest in music, in basketball, um, in philosophy. 
he feels comfortable with me because I don't have to make him talk about big stuff. He would help me when Julius was little. He would say, "Oh, can I feed him?" He said, "Can I change the diaper?" And I let him change the diaper. He loves Julius. My parents told me that you know we're going to be a great mathematician because I was pretty confident in myself. I was five years old. You know, I learned my multiplication tables ahead of everyone. I sort of devised what I thought would be like a super difficult problem that he wouldn't be able to solve. Sometimes he needs to be just by himself because he needs time to think about his mathematic things. And uh, so my my house is always open for him. Well, he always seemed to be thinking about something. You know, he would always zone out, you know. But then again, me and my dad were, were kind of like that too. He would just go and problem solving in his notebook. And I said, do you have a set of problems? No, just in my mind, I come up with the problem and I solve them. Unless I was sleeping, always I would try to think about the next problem. More than 2,000 years ago, the Greek mathematician Eratosthenes developed the first sieve for looking for prime numbers. It's sort of like a strainer, and you dump all the numbers into it, and then the ones that aren't prime fall through the holes. You start with two, and two is prime. Then you let all the numbers divisible by two fall through the holes. Then you go on to three, and you let all the numbers divisible by three fall through the holes. Now four has already fallen through, so then you go on to five, and let all the numbers divisible by five fall through the holes and so on. So in this particular set, we actually have quite a lot of twin primes. We have, we have three and five, five and seven, 11, 13, and so forth. Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't, our, our knowledge of SIF theory, um, our SIF theory is not able to um, guarantee that as you keep going to larger and larger um, sets of numbers, that you will always keep finding these, these pairs of, pairs of, um, these pairs of twins. So people for a long time have been trying to find uh, better ways of serving, where you would expend less energy and still be able to come to the primes. Maybe you wouldn't find all the primes, but you would hope to find most of the primes. Maybe you would hope to find the primes plus some junk. Maybe it's exactly like pan for primes, if you like, it's like pan for gold. So you expect to be left with the gold, but maybe you get some other things left behind as well. There's a very well established heuristic, actually, which goes back to Hardy and Littlewood back in the 1920s. This actually predicts not only that there's any many twin primes, but actually um, an almost exact formula for how many twin primes there should be up to any large number, like up to a trillion, up to, up to a quadrillion, how many twin primes there should be. You can check numerically by computer um, that this prediction is, is accurate to, to really high accuracy. If you, if you count how many twin primes there are up to a trillion, then up to like four or five decimal places, it's the same as, as these predictions. So we, we have these heuristic models for the primes coming from, from um, probability, and, and they're extremely accurate as far as we can tell. Uh, we just can't prove that they're accurate. You can just observe numerically that they're accurate. My mentor managed to improve the distribution of prime gaps and mentioned the problem to me, and uh, around 85, I worked with uh, Fred Lander and Ivanich on the, this type of problems, we tried to very hard to go beyond the square root values for the case of prime numbers, we obtained some partial results. I had a great the computer with great electronic is just the papers, and they provide very good ideas about that. I worked on it only because I wanted to figure out if this method from 1965, um, whether the result you got was the best you could do or whether you could do better. Slowly what happened was we moved over to this other method. In trying to answer that question, we eventually came up with what's now called a GPY sieve. It was a beautiful theorem that it did in fact prove that there were gaps within primes which were less than a millionth of the average size of the gap. And the paper also had another remarkable idea which nobody had guessed before, which was that if uh, you could understand something about the distribution of prime numbers in arithmetic progression, which is an area that people have spent a lot of time thinking about and which is connected to problems in mathematics like the linear hypothesis, then you would in fact get bounded gaps within primes. Mm -hmm.
The goldston pins theorem, or GPY spin, makes the connection between prime gaps and something called an arithmetic progression. An arithmetic progression is just a sequence of numbers that have the same spacing from one number to the next, like 5, 9, 13, 17, 21, where the numbers all differ by 4, or 7, 11, 15, 19, where again you have a spacing of 4. But if you look at the two odd progressions, you start to notice that the primes flow evenly into the two progressions. There's kind of a balance between how many primes are in one progression and in the other. And in the GPY paper, they made a connection between this balance and the gaps between prime numbers. That phenomena that the primes sort of flow into the different arithmetic progressions evenly should continue to happen even when the difference between the primes is, gets pretty large. So when you look at primes up to x, that you want to look at progressions that have jumps of size square root of x, and they should still evenly distribute among them. The goldston pins uh, technique is a very ingenious version of the cell, which works in this very special situation where you have a small set of numbers from n to n plus some big number. It gives a mechanism by which you could somehow find Every once in a while, there are two numbers inside this inside this interval, which are primes. So if a technique like that works, then it shows, because there are two numbers in the short interval that are primes, that there are small gaps between consecutive prime numbers. When we first came up with our result in 2005, we were able to do all these things that no one had done before. So at that point, I, I actually remember th claiming that maybe we'd be able to prove the twin prime conjecture, in a, you know, and I was working on it. But that was before we um, sort of found the limitations in our method. In other words, there was no cheap trick which would allow you to get this, uh, this result. So they, they had gotten to a barrier and they managed to squeeze the maximum they could without going past that barrier. But you really had to cross this barrier in order to get the next big result. We know that if you look at all the arithmetic progressions with a given spacing, the prime numbers flow evenly into the different progressions. But how far out in the progressions do you have to go in order to see this balance in the number of primes they have? Mathematicians showed that you'll usually start seeing this balance by the time you've gotten out to about the square of the spacing in between the, the numbers. So for example, if you have progressions with a spacing of 10, you'll start seeing this balance by the time you get out to about 100. But this wasn't quite enough to prove that prime gaps are bounded. To do that, Mathematicians needed to show that this balance appeared a little bit before the square, but no one could figure out how to do that. And mathematicians called this the square barrier. So Zhang came along and he addressed the hardest and most difficult approach that had ever been considered. And then somehow he, he, his head was hard enough and he broke through that wall. And he actually made progress on the technique proposed by Goldson, Pinson, and Yildrim. I learned that he sometimes he lived in his car. He never talked about that. That's why he left the Purdue and he's looking for a job. After Purdue, he did some fellowship work at Princeton. And then that was a temporary arrangement, one year or two years. And then um, this other pro-democracy person bought some subways and he needed some help. And Tom was between jobs. So he came over and he helped with him the accounting work and all that. Between 1992 to 1999, sometimes I worked in the subway store. Even though people talk about the hard time, I think he he treats it as a, a money earning a position. And because most of the time, if he wants to shut off, he can. If he wants to just go into his world, he can. Then after several years, eventually I got to just a lecture job at the University of New Hampshire. Tom John first came to UNH uh, in late 1999 and uh, was hired as lecturer and taught for the first time in the spring semester of 2000. The students value his classes because of the way that he organizes both the course and the material. They uh, feel that that organization of material uh, reduces the barriers to passing the course. Is also a zero. 
he always really cared about the math more than, you know, worrying about the grades or anything. It was more that you understand it. That was the important thing. For clarity and effectiveness, I would say that Professor Tom uh, was one of the top professors that I had at the University of New Hampshire. When he taught at the University of New Hampshire, he was the best teacher award was given to him. I can read these evaluations here that give some sort of sense of an overall uh, view of him. Uh, this one says, Tom is the best. He's a great teacher, and he makes it easy to understand potentially difficult concepts in calculus. He's funny, too. Everybody loves Tom. And then a footnote. He should stop smoking. It's not good for him. Should be the H is contained in P. I think P should be stopped in H. He could be seen at all hours of the day or night in this building, wandering, thinking. This was recognized uh, by members of the department, by his own students who would see him at times in the building when they would see no other professors. Could it be evident? I'm shy. He says he's shy. He proclaims this with regularity, but he says put him in front of a mathematical audience and give him mathematics to talk about, and he's not shy anymore. Also, we can verify the keys. You could just see that he was happy. And just by the way he started class and the way he went over, you could see that he really enjoyed what he was doing. He just loved the mathematics behind it. And he just loved being able to write it on the board and describe it to the students. And I could really feel that energy. To teach a course, of course, you have to understand it. Otherwise, if you could do nothing. You have to reorganize the materials. You have to think about what should be the best way to express it, to present it. That's my philosophy. It's interesting, right? He's a professor. Even though he was an adjunct, he should have his own apartment. But for some reason that he chose to live with the Chinese student, and every weekend he will cook for them. He cooks so well. He, he cooks for us, and he cooks um, most of the Chinese food, and it's a very nice cook. He made the wonton. He made them. He arranged them like an army. He's such an organized person. Because my life style is very simple. I don't worry about the houses, the cars, <laughs> the enjoyments, the enjoyments, lots of things. So I still have a lot of time. After getting the job in New Hampshire, I went to New York to see my friends. Then the friend took me to the Chinese buffet in Long Island. She was the waitress there. My friends just introduced, oh, this is the doctor. He came from Peking University, then asked her, do you like him? Then in that way, that, that day, I. I might drink so much, too much. I get old cat home, I used to go to restaurant eating, eating the long time, one year. So, I saw it so very nice, you just happy talking, joking. Today, I take my, my friend come here. And this guy in the China, the university, well, the very nice, they did the work at the university. Uh, you like the local there? I said, what do you like about that? Ah. I love that. Oh, I said, look, she's too old. I said, no, no. <laughs> I just I talk to my restaurant, uh, there's a owner, uh, owner, there's a wife. I said, look, this, uh, this guy's okay. Uh, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I don't meet him the time, <laughs> the first time. <laughs> but then, after a couple of days, my friend uh, brought me and her together in another restaurant. Then we got. No, no chance. All of a sudden, you said, I'm married. Bubbly person, happy, and they just get along. I don't know how she gets home to talk to her. I'm so bad at making this. I like the dancing, like the talking, like Heidi. She is a good dancer. 
I, I, I couldn't. <laughs> I used to be very quiet. It's very quiet now, now, now talking. I just only, I know, I just get to make a cooking, uh, drink a beer, drink a wine. I see happy. We are talking a lot of hours. It's a miracle how they get along and <laughs> serve being a couple. I do, I just go to go anywhere, look at the way we're nice, uh, go shopping, <laughs> go everything, look. <laughs> I like a vacation, like a, like a travel. That's okay if you have a very different personalities. Still, you can find the way to get used to each other. No problem. morning of April 17th, a Wednesday, I was uh, sitting in my office and Tom came in uh, and uh, across the desk passed uh, a, a manuscript to me. And it was uh, the, uh, the paper that he was uh, telling me he was going to submit to the annals uh, later that morning. That was the first time that I was aware that he was even working on that problem. I am deluged with manuscripts in elementary number theory by people who are not professional mathematicians who claim typically to have solved simultaneously Fermat's last theorem, the twin prime conjecture, Goldbach's conjecture, and usually uh, some unified theory of physics. I consider it my duty as a scientist to answer once. So, to protect myself, I I can answer, you would say why it's wrong, and say I received many requests like yours. I cannot devote all my time. You got my report. You, and I don't look at revisions and to don't send anything because I will not answer from somebody else. A lot of these people you can just tell from reading a few words. Usually they're very defensive. Um, and everybody else is wrong. Um, that, that's often giveaway that you're probably not going to enjoy this experience. I'm the expert on rejecting twin prime proofs. You would think they would be better proofs. They're just garbage. And so our default presumption is one of skepticism when, when we hear about a, a, a big result, especially if it's from someone who hasn't been that active. The paper came in. It was assigned to me. It's not a subject I'm particularly expert in, but I knew who was expert in it. So I, I sent it to such an expert and got basically an immediate reply, certainly within 24 hours. Um, if this paper is correct, it's a fantastic breakthrough. I was having lunch here at the Institute and one of the editors of Annans was there and said, we received a paper and um, something is not quite too many problems and problem gaps. And uh, why some unknown Chinese mathematician and, you know, we received so many of these things uh, um, actually handled it. I can only imagine uh, what went through the uh, minds of the uh, of the staff at the annals when in through the electronic transom comes this uh, perfectly crafted paper. At some point, one has to decide uh, what to do with this. There was a line by line checking of the paper. No mistakes. Two misprints. One item to add to the bibliography. Some parts could be simplified, but the result was so significant and important. The way the the design managed to break the square root barrier was new. Then just after three weeks, it was accepted. It was approved. Correct. One month later, it was already published in electronic form, and now it's appeared in printed form. So it was under the key of the star. We tried to find a certain upper bound for this one, as good as possible, but still it is a lot of things remaining. 
Before doing that, let me mention something. If the, the classical treatment of the sexual problem, my reaction was, wow, who is this guy? And he showed the master of the, the subject of uh, understanding. Somebody working at not a big research institution on their own without the right sort of mentors who we've basically never heard of. And it doesn't happen. It's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. That happened in just one day. Thank you. The next year, why I called him. I said, congratulations, Tom. And uh, you made it. I'm so happy for you. He said, you know what? I solved this problem in your backyard. I said, when? 2012, I called Nita. I said, well, now Julius is ready for Hercules. Can you come? And also, of course, I have great wines in the house, and I know he, he loves wine. So he came with one bag, one baseball cap. He spent one hour with Julius in the morning, and then eat with us. Talk to Jacob about music, drink. I tried to get a break. So I didn't bring any paper, any pen, nothing. After that, I found that my mind was more clear, more productive or something. Every July 4th, that since I'm in Pueblo, I give a public release free concert at the Riverwalk. On the July 3rd, I have a dress rehearsal. So before I get ready, he said, well, let me see where the deers are coming to the yard. I tried to find some deers. Lots of time the deers went to their house. <laughs> but I didn't see any deer. That time, just very suddenly, I got an idea. Oh. We can go this way. I just think first from main turn, oh, we can do something like this. Then to the end turn, also we can do something for that. Again, main error, main error, then eventually after maybe, maybe half hour, or maybe 20 minutes, I was sure there is a certain way to, to do it. And he didn't say anything. And after he went to the rehearsal in the concert, he was really excited uh, to hear stars and stripes forever. He loved that. You know, he, after the concert, he was, you know, like, hum this tune all the time. I didn't think anything more. All the things that come into the same, I hadn't expected. He told his wife, Look at what YouTube says. He said, well, I have good news for you. And they said, well, what news, you know? I tried to make a trick to her. I didn't tell her the story. I just uh, told her, pay attention to the media to see the newspaper. Should they have something to do with me? Then she asked them, what do you mean? What do you mean? I say, you, you will find. Go to the internet, huh? Wow. He said, what, what do you mean? Are you drunk? <laughs> Tell me, huh? me. <laughs> I don't see that they like watch the internet. Oh my god. I you, 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 you go outside and take your hair now to do the hair nice, do hair. <laughs> it was very timely because the Cole Prize for number three, which is um, one of the most prestigious prizes in the world, was due to be handed out in January 2014. And um, 
the committee was meeting in April 2013 when the news of Zhang came up and was very quickly verified. And so they chose to give a medal to Golson Pence Yildrim and Zhang for the fantastic breakthrough. Then my life became complicated. Lots of interviews, maybe too many emails and invitations. They treat me just like a hero, like a star. It was difficult to me, maybe not to her. Tom told his wife, I promise when we when we married, when we were getting married, I told you that I will give you a lot. At that time, I couldn't give you much. Now, what do you want? She has been happier with the changes of the life, and uh, she's very proud of me, of me and herself. She went to many places like Taiwan, the Beijing, Maryland, China, and uh, maybe like in, uh, you know, at Berkeley, at, at the Columbia University. She now has many chances to, to travel with me. <laughs> And I want to travel from that town, go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Of course, we are getting just a little richer in money. You know, he should enjoy life a little more, rather than everything is mathematics and philosophy. You know, the twin prime conjecture is one of the longest standing unsolved problems in mathematics. And the fact that he would make such a groundbreaking discovery about it, just a sense of awe, just a sense of awe. Where Zhang, I think, is, was exceptional was to go into the proof of the work of the paper of Bombier with Friedland and Ivanich, understand the exact mechanism that makes it tick, and tinker with that combined with Gold and Yildirim to change it enough to make these things meet with an unconditional proof. When he said it came out, he said that he could find pairs of primes whose distance apart was less than 70 million, and which was a nice round number. But almost immediately, people started looking at his paper and noticing that if you were a little bit more careful in certain steps of the proof, you could improve this bound of 70 million a little bit. Zhang's work raised the question, why 70 million? There's nothing magical about that number. It served Zhang's purposes and simplified his proof. Other mathematicians quickly realized that it should be possible to push this separation bound quite a bit lower although not all the way down to two. By the end of May, mathematicians had uncovered simple tweaks to Zhang's argument that brought the bound below 60 million. A May 30th blog post by Scott Morrison of the Australian National University in Canberra ignited a firestorm of activity as mathematicians vied to bring this bound lower and lower. By June 4th, Terence Tao of the University of California, Los Angeles, the winner of the Fields Medal, Mathematics' highest honor, had created a polymath project, an online collaboration that attracted dozens of participants. And lots of people started paying attention to, to this little game, if you wish, of improving the numbers. For like two months, our band just kept going down and down. It was actually quite, um, quite exciting to watch. By July 27th, the team had succeeded in reducing the proven bound on prime gaps from 70 million to 4,680. The polymath project has been very valuable. It's really changed the landscape. So I started working on an article about the polymath project. And just around the time when I was finishing it up and getting ready to turn in my first draft, I suddenly heard that James Maynard, who I knew nothing about, had produced an alternate proof that brought the prime gap down to 600. Here comes another proof. Completely different. This was the Maynard. Uh, young guy from Oxford, and uh, the paper is just by sieve. However, he uses a multi-dimensional sieve with the dimension going to infinity, or at least extremely large. Gold and Pinson Udirum had introduced weights that depended fundamentally on one variable, and a natural generalization that I was looking at was ways in which um, the weights could somehow incorporate some slightly more arithmetic structure. And one way of doing this was to incorporate many variables. And the key modification that I had was that I found the right way to introduce a multivariable generalization of the Golson-Pinson-Udirum weights. 
and by introducing more variables, I was able to um, have some weights that were slightly more concentrated on prime numbers, and this is what enabled me to get um, certain improvements to the results of our band catch in primes. The fact that there is an absolute bound, an absolute number, so that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by no more than that number is an extraordinary breakthrough. It's got nothing to do with the average gap. He's shown that there's just some finite number. And now the number's down to two or three hundred. So what do we know? We know that no matter how far you go out, you can find prime numbers such that the next prime is no more than a couple of hundred away. You can take many, many theorems in the theory of prime numbers and sort of just add now a sentence, thanks to my own, and it will be uh, you can produce the prime numbers we're looking for in such a way that there will be bounded gaps between them. These gaps could be very big, and you don't know what the gaps are, but they are bounded. Now one can combine Zhang's ideas and my ideas to get a um, strong result in some questions to back gaps in prime numbers, precisely because these ideas are somewhat separate, and so they can be quite naturally combined with each other. In fact, a second form of the Polymath project, Polymath 8b, was set up to try and optimize the new ideas that I'd introduced and combine it with the ideas of Shang to try and get the strongest possible gaps in primes. And so I've been an active participant. The current world record, at least as of the moment, is that there's infinitely many pairs of primes that differ by most 246. We're still nowhere near two. And the question of um, how long will it be until we prove there are infinitely many twin primes? In other words, that the gap two occurs infinitely often. Your guess is as good as mine. It could be a year, it could be a century. Maybe we're ready to start working at that level, and maybe other problems can get solved. For example, um, there's the Goldbach conjecture. Uh, the Goldbach conjecture is the statement that every even number, say, bigger than four, should be written as a sum of two primes. So like, like eight can be written as three plus five and so on and so forth. So this is a conjecture. It's very similar to the twin prime conjecture, actually. A twin prime conjecture is conjecture by differences of primes. Both back to the conjecture by sums of primes. They're very similar. And it's quite likely that a lot of the methods that, um, that uh, have given these partial results towards the twin prime conjecture should also give some partial results towards things like the back conjecture. I think a lot of people are now revisiting questions which were thought to be quite difficult. The great thing about great breakthroughs is that they not only allow you to address old questions, but they inspire new questions. So what else can we now do with primes that we never could do before? After you, you solve the bigger problem, then to me, I was not interested to this problem again. I try to change, to turn my interest quickly to some other problems. I think doing math, you can do everywhere. You just need one place to do the math yourself. Being placed, uh, maybe my personality is so quiet. I didn't contact so much with the other people. Of course, I love this area. So I've got to know a little bit. One day I saw him and I said hi. And he said, hello. And he said, that's the first word he'd said to anybody in the last 10 days because he'd been so isolated. So I was a little concerned that that's a little too much. I mean, he clearly likes to just work uh, at his own pace. So we agreed to have lunch once a week, and which we have done since. And during that time, he's opened up every now and then. And he's discussed a little bit this very uh, pressing problem he's working on. This is the so-called non-dosy zero. I have been working on it for many years. The L function might have a zero very, very close to one. That's called a zero zero. That's the problem is to prove that such a zero never exists. I have a lot of partial results, but I'm not going to publish them. It's kind of It's been quite a year for Chong, who goes by Tom at UNH. 
as the recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Grant, Tom will receive a stipend of $625,000 paid over five years with no strings attached. I had heard something about this prize, but I had never expected that it would come to me. They informed me about this one. And the one question is, do not tell other person with one exception. Now this exception is Helen, my wife Helen. I just told her. <laughs> On behalf of the, uh, the Rolf Schock Foundation and the three academies, I wish to convey our warmest congratulations. We are the Princess and Christina come up to see and they will use our Rolf Schock Prize Mathematics. Thank you. He had every intention of staying at the place where he had accomplished these things and continuing to work. Doing mathematics is the most important thing. I may not care so much where I can do it. Here, this is a very quiet place. I can concentrate on what I like, so I just prefer to be here. Other universities, they may give me better offer, much more money, something, but I think it's okay, we just stay here. My belief is that what he has found here, he still values here, and uh, our goal is to make sure that those conditions are still here for him. He doesn't really talk about, you know, his achievements. He's uh, always the same. He said, well, I just want to a, a situation that I still can do my thinking. He chose the loneliness. He chose solitude. He proved a very beautiful thing that was believed by the experts to be out of reach. He went to the deepest of the deep, and he fully understood. And his paper establishes him just in the, in the depth of thinking as one of the top half dozen people in the world in the field, from nowhere. It's gratifying that you're alive and you've seen this. The human race actually proved this result. I was so happy that he got to solve this problem for the world, but I feel like, yeah, if anybody, he probably should be the one. He's great. <laughs> <laughs>